preparatory <laughs> to talking about uh, understatement penalties. And I apologize for wearing a white shirt and looking all formal, but I've just come from court. Um, I, what I, wanted to well, do... <laughs> I don't know about nice. And so they say your best haircut is, is about two weeks after you've had your haircut. <laughs> I'm still in that initial period. Um, <clears throat> Funnily enough, the case I've just been involved with today also involves understatement penalty, so this stuff is fairly yeah. fresh. Um, perhaps I should start uh, by saying um, that uh, Section 222.1 of the Tax Administration Act provides as follows. And it says, um, in the event of an understatement by a taxpayer, mm. the taxpayer must pay in addition to the tax payable for the relevant tax period, the understatement penalty determined under subsection two, unless the understatement results from a bona fide inadvertent error. Mm. Um, and what I thought we could focus on today is what does that mean, a bona fide inadvertent error? Um, you know, one would think that the English is, is not all that exceptional, but there's a case that um, I think the taxpayer is probably going to be the first to publish that I got hold of almost by mistake. And uh, I mentioned it to Jonathan Sook of, of the South African tax cases, and he'd never heard of it. So, so SATC will publish it next year. But it's a judgment of Fonzale DJP, Deputy Judge President, handed down on the 11th of December, 2019. So it was quite a while back dealing with understatement penalties and, uh, and he goes in great detail into what is meant by a bona fide inadvertent error. Um, the facts of that case were, uh, speaking from memory, that um, the taxpayer, which was a company, its accountants had recommended that they switch their depreciation policy for accounting purposes to match the SARS um, wear and tear allowance or depreciation allowance under section 11E of the Income Tax Act. So that's what they did. In the course of doing that, something was supposed to have been added back. Um, the accountants overlooked adding it back. The taxpayer didn't spot the error. And so um, the matter went uh, just went through and event and SARS did a uh, an audit in respect of the 2012 to 2016 years of assessment and they picked up the fact that in respect of the 2016 year this add back had not taken place. Now the taxpayer had an assessed loss so it didn't actually affect the amount of tax payable but um, SARS imposed uh, an understatement penalty and uh, the taxpayer said that this was a result of a bona fide inadvertent error. And that then caused um, Judge uh, Fonsell to write this judgment and he goes into it in, in, in some detail. Uh, perhaps it's worth mentioning also that the word understatement is defined in section 221 to mean the following, any prejudice to SARS or the fiscus as a result of a default in rendering a return, B, an omission from a return, C, an incorrect statement in a return, or D, if no return is required, a failure to pay, to pay the correct amount of tax. Uh, since 2016, there's an E that's been added and that relates to an, uh, to an impermissible avoidance arrangement, uh, which has its own problems in my opinion. Um, so in this case, there was no omission from a return. And in case I've been involved in today, it was exactly the same thing. Um, the taxpayer in this case took the point, as indeed <laughs> I've been doing today as well, that because the company had an assessed loss, there was no prejudice to SARS uh, or the fiscus. And I think there's a lot in that point. The judge wasn't terribly impressed with it. Uh, but what he did was he recognized that um, due to the existence of the assessed loss, no tax would have been payable anyway. So, so SARS wasn't out of pocket as far as tax was concerned, but it, it had overstated its um, assessed loss. And 
taxpayer then said that th this would probably have been picked up in the following year. And the judge then, based on, on the facts of the case, then just looked into whether what the probabilities were, whether it would have been picked up or not. And he decided that based on the fact that it wasn't picked up in the 2016 year, it was probably unlikely to be picked up in the subsequent years. Taxpayers' track record didn't help. And, and therefore he held that there was prejudice to SARS. And he cited the, um, what's the name of that case? Um, starts with a P. Uh, I've got the case, yes, a Polish case. Um, where, where the court held that prejudice doesn't have to be financial prejudice. It can be um, some other form of prejudice, for example, going to the expense of conducting an audit, et cetera, et cetera. Although in this particular case, it seemed that that order would, would have taken place anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not so sure that that is correct, because if you look at section 92, Again, that Polish case was dealing with um, the understatement penalties. But if you look at section 92 of the Tax Administration Act, it says if at any time um, SARS is satisfied that an assessment does not reflect the correct application of a tax act to the prejudice of SARS or the fiscus, SARS mm -hmm. must make an additional assessment to correct the prejudice. What that suggests is that by making an additional assessment, you can correct the prejudice, which suggests to me that the prejudice is financial prejudice. It's not all the trouble that SARS goes to uh, in, in doing its job anyway. You know, and so one was then asked the question, I think that that's probably correct insofar as section 92 is concerned. Now, was it really intended to be used in a different sense in the understatement penalty section, I can't imagine that. that Especially was where you're dealing with penalties, because I mean, that is an imposition of something over and above your tax, you know, so exactly. you understand that you owe your tax and you, you understand that you owe interest as well, because time value of money, if you're supposed to pay your tax 10 years ago and you only pay it now, clearly there's been a benefit. So paying your yeah. tax, which we often refer to as capital and interest, I think is accepted by taxpayers, but penalties should be imposed and in extreme circumstances, they shouldn't be sort of imposed lightly, if you like. So to give oh. that sort of reading to the concept of, of, of prejudice uh, seems to go very much against the sort of the taxpayer's interests and um, certainly not contra fiscum. Yeah, I agree. And, and uh, you know, where, where the taxpayers an assessed loss, so that whether the amount was disclosed or not, uh, it wouldn't have, there would have been no tax payable. Mm. Um, I would say, so that, that results in the overstatement of an assessed loss, which of course might affect the taxpayer's tax in the future. But exactly. to me, that's, that's potential prejudice. The yeah. fact is that it was picked up, was picked mm. up by SARS and they've corrected the prejudice. So mm. where's the actual prejudice? And you know, what, it's one thing to say prejudice doesn't, is not limited to, to financial prejudice. It's quite mm. another to mm. say that it covers potential prejudice. So I, I think the court was wrong on that on that aspect. And especially if you can, as you say, if you can rectify it, you know, you say, yeah. would stars have collected any more tax? No, they wouldn't because the company wasn't in an assessed loss position. So yeah. that yeah. doesn't that doesn't feel like a prejudice. It's interesting because tax benefit under GAR includes the situation where you're in a tax loss because it refers specifically to a postponement of a tax liability. So, you know, that's a completely different concept and different definition. But sort of yeah. interestingly, if you, if you, you know, part of a tax benefit is if you sidestep and anticipate a tax liability, even if you're in a tax loss position. Um, but again, that's a, you know, different, different term, different definition, different context. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't, I don't like that. I don't, that does, I don't, that doesn't sound right to me, Trevor. Yeah. Um, I agree. It's interesting. Just, just, just picking up on your point though because understatement refers to an omission from a return and an incorrect statement in a return i've often wrestled with what what does that mean because that can be quite subjective you can have a dispute with so you can have a dispute about something in terms of whether something is for example capital or revenue and if you don't disclose it as revenue and you think it's capital are you omitting something or are you making an incorrect statement or are you just making a statement based on your understanding of the law and the application of the law to the facts
Yeah. So I think this this omission from a return and an incorrect statement in a return is also something that one can get one's teeth into. You know, yeah. if you take a certain filing position based on advice and SARS disagrees, that doesn't mean that you've made an incorrect statement. You think you've made a correct agree. statement. Yeah, you know, I so agree. it's a question of is it a subjective test or objective test? And at what point do you determine it? Just because SARS thinks it's wrong doesn't mean that it is wrong. <laughs> yeah. So do you wait until you get up to the SCA in Bloemfontein? But again, I think one should give those words quite a narrow meaning. You know, a mission from a return to me just means you just left something out. You should have put something yeah. in and you didn't put it in. Yeah. Uh, it's not where you take a particular filing position. I, I, I couldn't position agree with you more. I couldn't mm. agree with you more. Um, uh, and, and I think this judgment of Fancel DJP, he, he actually supports that. Oh, good. Um, what, what he says in paragraph two, 42 of his judgment, he said, and this is a quote from his judgment, it may be reasonable for a taxpayer in the circumstances and absent any reason to believe it to be wrong to rely on professional expert advice and guidance on the appropriate tax treatment of differing heads of income and profit and loss, which are not straightforward and of which the taxpayer has no or little knowledge. A reasonable taxpayer in circumstances where this, where there is need for expert advice would obtain such advice with a view of ensuring that his tax return is correct. So I think he accepts that point. That's spot on, and, I like and, it. Yeah. Um, so there is a redeeming feature of, of this judgment. <laughs> But, but he, he unfortunately held that the taxpayer ought to have picked up the, the mistake in this case was held, was made by the auditors. You know, everyone, I mean, I was in court this afternoon I, and I, I, in re-examination, I had a, a chartered accountant in the witness box, the, the financial director of, our, of the taxpayer company. And I, I asked him one question in, in re-examination. I, I said, Mr. Sansa, uh, in, in your experience, have you ever known a chartered accountant to make an error? <laughs> and of course, he answered, yes, he has. <laughs> Even chartered accountants are human. Um, and, and to me, it just seems wrong to suggest that, you know, you employ your chartered accountant to prepare your tax return and then to expect you to second guess them and, and then check whether they're correct or not. I mean, what's the point of, that, of, of using an expert? Um, it almost, almost then requires you, like, like, what is the threshold? What is the hurdle rate then? You go to an advisor, they, they give you advice and they fill out a return. Do you then always, as a matter of course, need to go to someone else just in case they've made an error? And what if the second person makes the same error or doesn't pick it up? I mean, where does, where does it end? And Trevor, it goes well, back a little bit to that spur case that we discussed last, last well, time, well. you know, in terms of uh, prescription relating to tax returns and not... Uh, correctly making statements in your in your tax returns or just making errors in your tax returns and and yeah. the prejudicial results that can create through prescription yeah. and now penalties it's actually quite scary yeah, and tax is. is complicated and, and filing yeah. is complicated yeah the one thing that Fancel did say was that you can't impute the the um, mistakes of a professional advisor to the taxpayer mm. So he found against the taxpayer on the basis that the taxpayer had not taken reasonable care in preparing the tax return, which I think is harsh in the circumstances. Mm. But uh, let me uh, have a bit of fun with this judgment um, because I like giving the example of, you know, if, if a higher court overturns a judgment of a lower court, the, the typical language will be that the lower court erred. In other words, it made an error. Mm. And that, that expression, bona fide inadvertent error, the word inadvertent governs the noun error. It doesn't govern the taxpayer's conduct or behavior. It governs the nature of the error. Um, and I mean, just in court today in an opening statement, I was saying to the judge, you know, judges also make errors. <laughs> we, would, we would never suggest that they were deliberate errors. Of course not. Uh, but, and, and are they inadvertent? I would think the answer is yes, and to, to suggest that they're not is, so. would, be imp would be impertinent, you know. <laughs> At least. It would be contempt of court. But somehow when it comes to the taxpayer, the, the, the shoe is on the other foot. But anyway, um, in this judgment, when Sale made three errors, and it's quite interesting to test his own judgment against the errors that he made. 
given that we're talking about bona fide inadvertent errors. And that's what his whole judgment was about. Mm -hmm. Firstly, he referred to the Africa cash and carry case. And he, he misspelled Africa and he made it African cash and carry with an N at the end of Africa. Now, we would all accept that's, that's a bona fide inadvertent error. Mm -hmm. It's just a spelling mistake. No one's going to quarrel about that. Mm -hmm. um, slightly more serious, but I think also, uh, as, as Tfonsel put it, an excusable error. He, he, he says, you know, certain errors are excusable. And I don't like that statement. It, it implies that, that, that you are prima facie liable, but then you can be excused. I think, well, if, you, if it's a bona fide inadvertent error, you don't need to be excused, it's mm. just not liable. But his second error was he said that the, the judgment was written by NAFSA JA. It wasn't. It was written by Kun AJA. And again, I would say that's an inadvertent, in a, uh, a bona fide inadvertent error. NAFSA JA was the senior judge. So if you just look at the very top of a law report and you see who the judges were, NAFSA's name would be there first. And he probably just took that name and attributed the judgment to him. But in fact, NAFSA didn't write the judgment, despite the fact that he was the senior judge. But again, you know, that, who cares? I mean, yeah, it is quite important who writes the judgment, but it's not, perhaps not of earth shattering importance. But he made a third error, which I think is quite important. Right at the end of his judgment, he just said that costs must follow the result. So the taxpayer lost the case, so the taxpayer must, must pay the costs. Now, what he overlooked, and maybe counsel should have drawn this to his attention, but everybody seems to have overlooked section 130 of the Tax Administration Act, which says that either the taxpayer or SARS can only get costs if the other party's grounds are unreasonable. So there has to be a finding that they're unreasonable and then you can get costs. And he, he just wasn't aware of that. And I think that's a fairly serious error. Now, if you apply that to his own judgment, was that a reasonable mistake to make? I'm not so sure. So apply, <laughs> apply his own test that he's laying down in this case to his own judgment. I think mm -hmm. he's made an unreasonable error. I think he should have to pay, <laughs> pay <laughs> an understatement penalty. Well, I'm, I'm obviously talking nonsense now, but... Uh, you know, one must be realistic about these things. Even judges make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Uh, and I think the, you know, the, the mistake that SARS makes all the time is they don't see whether the, whether the error was inadvertent. They look at the, because the taxpayer deliberately claimed a certain deduction and say, therefore it's not inadvertent. That's not the point. The point is whether, if the taxpayer was mistaken, was the error inadvertent? And if you've been advised that something is deductible and you deduct it, as you were saying, Peter, I mean, that, um, there's nothing wrong with that. The interesting thing that's sort of also relevant in terms of understatement penalties is section 223. And interesting, Trevor, how sort of the concept of a 223 opinion has crept into our tax lexicon. We quite yeah. often asked as advisors to provide us, provide me with a 223 opinion. Yeah. And that's how it's become, as I say, it's become part of our sort of lexicon now as, as tax advisors. And that's on the basis that if you provide a tax uh, payer with an opinion as a registered tax practitioner, they can get out of understatement penalties. But there are a couple of nuances there, Trevor, you know, because oh. uh, taxpayers often think it applies ac across the board. It only applies to what's referred to as a substantial uh, a subst uh, substantial yeah, understatement, <clears throat> a yeah. substantial understatement, which sounds like that's a significant understatement, but that's actually the lightest of all of the categories of behavior in section 223 on the table in 223. So yes, you get out of penalties if you get the right opinion from a registered tax practitioner, but it's, it only applies to, to this, that category, it doesn't apply to the other categories. Yeah. And a couple of points as well. The opinion needs to be given before the tax return goes in. It needs to be based on all correct facts as well, which as a tax advisor, you're not sure about. So you have to assume that that is the case. Yeah. And it needs to state that the position of the taxpayer is more likely than not to be upheld, which is also quite interesting. Yeah. When we give tax advice, taxpayers often try and hold, a, hold us to a higher standard. You know, if you say more likely than not, that sounds like 51%. And they don't want 51%. Okay. They want a first. They want 75%. Okay. Okay. They want you to say it would. They want a would-level yeah. opinion, not a should-level opinion or yeah. may-level yeah. opinion. So 
uh, that threshold is quite low but one needs to remember to always include that wording and opinions and, and taxpayers yeah. again are quite sophisticated ones kind of understand that you know in your fairly yeah. standard wording yeah. around two two three but yeah. you know that to me is an interesting development yeah and uh, one aspect of this judgment of on sale and i think he might have a point here and I just, uh, you know need to perhaps think it through a bit more thoroughly he says that in deciding what is meant by inadvertent you have to have regard to the categories of behavior set out in section mm. two, 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 three, one, which is substantial understatement, reasonable care not taken in completing return, knows reasonable grounds for tax position taken, et cetera, gross negligence, intentional tax evasion. Mm. Um, so he's suggesting that, for example, reason, reasonable care not taken in completing a tax return, uh, that cannot cover that cannot be regarded as inadvertent. Well, I'm not sure which which oh, comes with. Yeah, yeah. maybe they just you know they just talk to slightly different things. I mean they have different concepts and different definitions. Yeah. The other interesting thing is is VDP because VDP voluntary disclosure program gets you out of penalties in quite a lot of circumstances, especially yeah. if you go before the default is found, which is typically how VDP works anyway. Yeah. reduces your penalties to zero in almost all cases um, oh. but voluntary disclosure uh, is not easy to get so you know if there are quite a few cases where clients have come and you make your submissions to SARS but it's quite a long arduous process it's not something to be underestimated it's not something that you quickly sort of go to SARS and say I'm applying for VDP and, and here we go yeah. you have a lot of toing and fraying with SARS they ask for a lot of information a lot of stuff isn't accepted at face value you have to kind of really prove your case yeah. And so it's not something, you know, to be undertaken lightly and the, the, uh, the outcome can be uncertain. Yeah. So, you know, it, it is good to have that as an option. And as I say, it's, it's very powerful in terms of understatement penalties and reducing those in almost all cases to zero. But yeah. it's, as I say, it's not an easy process to go through. Yeah. Yeah. The problem, as I said, is that, is it, you know, the, the, the uh, levying of understatement penalties almost become a knee-jerk reaction by science. Mm. If there's something they don't, don't agree with, so they disallow it, they, then they apply an understatement penalty. Very commonly imposed. And, and, yeah. often, is, and often at settlement, Trevor, is very interesting because when you go in and have a proper settlement hodgy-bodgy with SARS, the first thing you say needs to get off the table, be taken off the table, are understatement penalties. And generally, yeah. when you settle, understatement penalties disappear. Oh, yeah. So there's no doubt that that can be a bit of a bargaining chip as between the yeah. taxpayer and SARS. Um, and it gives SARS obviously a, a stronger bargaining or negotiating position going in if there are the understatement penalties, which can ultimately be reduced potentially to zero in the context oh. of a settlement discussion. Yeah. But I mean, in, in my opinion, um, and please tell me if you disagree, but in terms of section 102.2 of the Tax Administration Act, the burden of proving the facts upon which SARS has levied an understatement penalty is on SARS. That, that being the case, I think when in the SARS Rule 31 statement, they should have to plead uh, the basis on which they've come to the conclusion that there's no bona fide inadvertent error because that, the absence of a bona fide inadvertent error is a jurisdictional fact which must be present, must be absent in order to levy a bona, uh, an understatement penalty. And I think they need to get their act together a bit by actually pleading that properly, saying why they think that, what the basis on which they think that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and then in court as well, you know, I mean, typically they just make allegations, and that that's not how you discharge the burden of proof. Mm. And section so two twenty four tells us that understatement penalties are subject to objection and appeal, yeah. which is good. So you yeah. can object and appeal, obviously, to understatement penalties, and um, generally taxpayers do do that um, for some of the yeah. reasons you've articulated, Trevor. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think for SARS, sorry, I think for SARS to have the burden of proof is something new to them. They, they mm -hmm. not, it'll take a while before they get used to it. Yeah. Yeah.
Anyway. You know, and and it's something that you know, as, as you say, sort of often under seven penalties are just added on to an assessment. You're not sure how much consideration gets given to that. A lot of consideration gets given to the assessment itself, and there's obviously a lot of kind of forensic auditing being done by SARS. They get to a position where they've asked a lot of questions and they've landed on a position. They send you the notification of, of audit findings. And there's often long explanations for the technical position, and there's just penalties at the end. Yeah. And what you're saying, Trevor, which I think is right, is there should be as much consideration given to the penalties and the discussion around the penalties and the category of penalty and the bona fide inadvertent error not being present as there is to the substantive law that's analyzed but, in so much detail. They mustn't just be added on as an afterthought. Exactly. I think that's and, 100%. Uh, yeah, and the, and the um, the uh, matter I've been involved with today, there are two occasions where SARS invites the taxpayer to, to make any representations within 21 business days as, as to um, why penalty should not be imposed. But they don't say what penalty they have in mind. Mm. So, I mean, how, what kind of process is that? They should say mm. we, have, we, we uh, propose leaving a penalty of let's say 25% or whatever it might be for this reason. And we now invite you to make representations why we shouldn't do that. Then, then you've got something to work with, but where mm -hmm. it's just in a vacuum, you know, it's, 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 it's not, and I think, um, I think uh, the, our judge in this case is, is alive to the point. And but what we need is, what we need is some good authority from the, from the Supreme yeah. Court of Appeal. Oh, over to you, Trevor. But especially where SARS <laughs> are so focused on, on tax avoidance, because tax yeah. avoidance, we see a lot of tax avoidance assessments now, and they're yeah. the standard case percentage is 75%. That's a proper number. Yeah. So if SARS is going to go and using GAR anti-avoidance, and for a standard case, that's the repeat case is 100%, and then it goes up, uh, is 75%. That's, that's a significant amount of tax. Yeah. And that should be properly justified. And, 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 and I think, you know, uh, tell me if you disagree, but, but um, notwithstanding the way the Tax Administration Act is worded, that if there's, if there's an understatement, then the understatement penalty must be levied. At the end of the day, and I think a court will recognize it, at the end of the day, the purpose of a penalty is to punish. And the, the punishment should fit the crime, you know. Mm. Yeah, and I think it takes us back to these sort of omissions and incorrect statement positions as well, you know, that SARS should have consideration to that and, yeah. and see why the understatement penalty may not, it may not be appropriate to, to, yeah. to levy it in, in any instance. Yeah. So what's the moral of the story? Um, watch out for penalties and, and uh, you know, there are arguments that can be marshaled and um, there are points that can be taken. And get your section 223 opinion because that definitely helps. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Tax practitioner, get it in time, make sure it says the right stuff in terms of the 223 wording. Yeah. And, um, you know, and when the dispute comes along or the assessment comes along, then be sure to know that you can argue against understatement penalties. Yeah. And as I said, they are subject to objection and review as well. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much. As always. Yeah, yeah, thanks, yeah, nice to chat and uh, we'll do it again soon. <laughs> Onward and upward. Thanks. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, Peter. Nice to see you. Nice Cheers. To you too.